Eventually, I will talk about death, so let's start on a more positive note. I want you to think back to the first sin you remember committing. Maybe not the first sin you actually committed. We would have to ask someone from your family about that one. But the first sin you remember committing, that time in your life, that moment when you knew that you had crossed a line, that you had gone too far, that you felt deep guilt, even shame, and you knew that there was something dark at work in you. My first memory of my sin is from kindergarten. I was five years old. That's right. I got an early start at being a horrible person. And before you think I'm being too hard on myself, just listen to this story. In kindergarten, one day after school, my mom took me to the local variety store to buy me a new set of crayons because I had left my set of eight crayons in the car and they had melted and I had to get some new ones. And I went to the store with her hoping that I would be the first kid in my class to break the eight crayon barrier. So I was gunning for 16 crayons, but she was feeling really generous that day and so we left the store with a box of 64 crayons with the sharpener built in in the back of the box. Now, some of you are not impressed because crayon technology has evolved to the point that that sounds like nothing, but back then that was a big deal. And the next day I walked into the classroom and held up my box of 64 crayons and all the other students were in Oh, I was a hero. I had more choices for more colors than anyone in the class until the next day. And that's when Dora showed up in class with her own box, brand new box of 64 crayons with the sharpener built into the back of the box. And I couldn't stand it. I had two goons working for me at the time. <laughs> Philip Flores and Tony Diaz, and I gave them their instructions. And at recess, they took her box of crayons back behind a bush on the playground and started breaking them. I told you you wouldn't feel sorry for me by the time this story was over. And they started breaking her crayons. Why did I do that? If you will permit me to do a little bit of armchair psychology on myself, I think I did it because even at that young age, I really wanted to be special. I wanted to set myself apart from everyone else in my class. I wanted to be the crayon kingpin of kindergarten, and Dora ruined it. She thwarted my very first attempt to make a name for myself. And I responded with violence. And I knew it was wrong when I sent my henchmen to do my dirty work. I knew it was really wrong when I saw how upset Dora was and how long she cried. And I knew it was really, really wrong when Philip and Tony sang like canaries and my teacher <laughs> called me out into the hallway with her to introduce my backside to the Board of Education. <laughs> this was back when parents encouraged corporal punishment, not discouraged it. Every time I took a trip to the hall with my teacher and I told my mom, she would run to the phone, call my teacher and say, thank you, we need all the help we can get. Well, that wouldn't be the last time that I tried to make a name for myself and ended up hurting someone else in the process. But already at the tender age of five, I had two problems, at least. One was a sin problem. I would need to be forgiven of my sins, which would only multiply exponentially as the years passed. But the other was a problem that was harder to define, harder to describe. I had a problem of... of darkness at work inside of me. 
that would cause me to do such a terrible, nasty thing. Now, I didn't understand all of that when I was five years old. If I had been that brilliant in kindergarten, I wouldn't have been trying to impress my classmates with my crayons. But those problems were already there. That's my original sin story. And you have yours. And the details for yours are different, but aren't the two underlying problems there for all of us. We need to be forgiven, but we also need to be set free from the forces of darkness that are at work in and around and sadly through us. And the different writers in Scripture, they talk about solutions to those problems in different ways, and they use different language. Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's summarizing the gospel at the beginning of that chapter, he says, Christ died for our sins. He deals with our sin problem, but then you keep reading the chapter, and he begins to describe a different monster, scarier lurking behind sin. And when he describes Christ's finished work, at the very end, the final enemy to be defeated by the resurrected victorious Christ is more than sin. It's death itself. That monster lurking in the background of everything we do. For my money, no writer, no teacher of wisdom does a better job of explaining and diving into the predicament of death and the shadow it casts over our lives like the teacher in Ecclesiastes. In chapter 7, verse 2, the teacher says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting because death is the destiny of everyone and the living should take this to heart. So he says, it's better to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party because when you go to a funeral, you are reminded that you are going to die and you need to contemplate your death. That will help you better understand your life. And it's obvious when you read through Ecclesiastes that the teacher took lots of time to contemplate death. He can't get away from it. Even when it seems he almost explains it away and he's figured out a way around it, he he comes back to it. Early on in chapter 3, verse 18, he says the following. He says, I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and to dust we all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? And the teacher says, one thing we have in common with animals, with other creatures, is we are all going to die. We are finite. Our time on earth is short. We are not immortal. We are not gods. On a long enough timeline, the life expectancy of every single one of us is zero. And I appreciate that the teacher doesn't play the life after death card to relieve the tension. This is centuries before the resurrection of Jesus, and he says, I I don't know if there's anything after death. I have no idea. It may be when we're dead, we're dead like Rover, dead all over, and that's the best we can hope for. And he says, "So, so give yourself to the present moment. Focus on the task at hand. Concentrate on your work right here, right now, because you have no way of knowing what comes later. And that almost helps, but even the teacher can't leave it there. He keeps circling back to the problem of death to say, what's the point? What's the point of life when you're going to die? 
What's the point of being wise? What's the point of being good? What's the point of even being religious if death gets the final word over your life? Now, something that, that we don't have in common with the animals is that we are aware of our coming death. We know it. We feel it. We see it in the mirror. And if we can't see it in the mirror, we see it in the person sitting next to us. And there's nothing we can do about it. No amount of healthy eating, no amount of working out, doesn't matter how many body parts we have nipped and tucked and lifted, we can't avoid it, we can't escape it, we can't deny it. Charles Barkley likes to say over and over and over again, Father Time is undefeated. And the specter of our coming death looms over us and haunts us every day of our short lives. Happy Cinco de Mayo, by the way. <laughs> we are aware of our coming death in a way that the animals, other creatures, are not. At least we assume that's the case. They're very hard to do exit interviews with. But we assume we know something other creatures don't. Why? Because salmon don't need therapists. In my opinion, there are few creatures with a more tragic existence than salmon. They, they have one purpose, one goal in life. They're hatched in a river, and if they grow big enough to swim downstream, then they have to survive the deep waters of the ocean. And then when it's time, when their biological clock starts ticking, they have to swim upstream to accomplish their purpose in life. And they swim, and they swim, and they swim. And it's a struggle every inch of the way. And they're dodging fish nets, and they're dodging fish hooks, and they're dodging clever bears until finally they get to their point of origin. And now is the time, and they either lay their eggs or they come along and fertilize some eggs that have been laid, and as soon as they accomplish that task, the flesh on their body begins to decay at an accelerated rate, and they die. And we can contemplate the plight of the salmon and say, what a meaningless existence that's so cruel, so dark. And then the teacher from Ecclesiastes leans over and whispers in our ear, how do you know that your existence is any less futile? How do you know that you're any better off? because someday you're going to be just as dead as the salmon you pity. And this, I think, explains why he spent most of his time at funerals, because no one would invite him to parties. <laughs> Not the world's most positive message. In his book, The Slavery of Death, Richard Beck argues that it's this knowledge of death, this awareness, not just the awareness, the fear of it, the dread, death anxiety that actually makes us vulnerable to the forces of evil at work in the world around us and in us and upon us. And I know Beck's work has helped many of us think differently about the interdependent relationship between sin and death, sin and death and the forces of darkness and how they're all working together. Because on one hand, we know sin causes death. The wages of sin is death. And Adam and Eve sin, therefore we all die. We understand that order. But then there's another way of looking at it that Eastern Orthodox theologians really help us understand where, yes, sin may cause death, but also sin is death's sting. Sin is death's weapon. Death uses sin against us. And so we sin because we are born into a world of death. We sin because we are born with death embedded deep in our bones already. And so we have these two different monsters, these two different problems working with each other and working against us. Our sin is killing us, but our death drives us deeper and deeper deeper 
into sin. And at the risk of oversimplifying what Beck and others like Ernest Becker have done in his book, The Denial of Death, we see that death anxiety leads to violence in a basic way. When you're afraid to die, it, it tends to make you violent. You see this when someone is threatening your survival, you assess the competition and you eliminate the competition at all costs in order to secure your future. It's a natural impulse. But we can get caught, so caught up in preserving our future and surviving that we do harm to others unnecessarily. Think of Cain choosing to wipe out one-fourth of the world's population because he judges his brother to be a threat to his receiving a blessing from God. Or think about The Walking Dead and how Rick and his friends, decent people really, end up doing horrific things because they are living in a culture of death, surrounded by death. There's no end to the evil that human beings can do when we're afraid to die. But death anxiety also works on a more subtle level. It can be just as destructive, just as harmful. And that is, it manifests itself as a desire to make a name for ourselves. Before we die, hoping that our name will outlive us, or it manifests itself as the need to pretend that we're doing better than we really are. Or the need to avoid failure, avoid appearing to be a failure. Either never admitting it, keeping it a secret, or always trying to blame it on someone else. Because if we're failing, if we're not successful, if we're not winning in life, then we're wasting our lives. And if you die a failure, if you die with other people thinking you're a failure, then your life hasn't mattered. And so what we need is we need to be forgiven. But that's not enough. If we stop there, we end up with what Dallas Willard called the gospel of sin management. It allows us to celebrate the forgiveness of sins, but it doesn't necessarily transform our character. We need something more than that. We need to be set free, along with the rest of creation, groaning in its bondage to decay, from the forces of evil that are at work using death and all his friends to tyrannize us and to destroy every good thing God has created. And that's what makes the description of Jesus' achievement in Hebrews chapter 2 such good news. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, it says, since the children have flesh and blood, talking about us, he too shared in their humanity, so that, talking about Christ, by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted." In his book, A Community Called Atonement, Scott McKnight says this passage, this paragraph in Hebrews chapter 2, captures the full breadth of Jesus' work both as the Son of God and as the true human, as well as any passage of Scripture in the New Testament. You read it closely, it's all there. Jesus is the high priest who makes atonement for sins. He deals with the sin problem. But he also is described as the hero, as the liberator, 
as our champion who goes down into the pit of death and comes out alive. And in doing so, sets us free from death, sets us free from the slavery of the fear of death and breaks the power that evil has over us, which would manipulate and exploit our fear. And he does this, the writer says, by fully identifying with our humanity. He wasn't just made like us. He became like us to experience what we experience, to live the kind of life we live, and to know what it's like to be one of us. And so he fully identified with it. He identified with our pain and our suffering and our grief and our struggles and our temptation and our failure. He identified with us all the way down to death, the worst human experience. And when his father brought him safely out of the pit, on the other side, he brought us with him. And he liberated us from our captivity to sin and death. And now his victory over sin and death is our victory over sin and death. That's the gospel in a paragraph. But to say that we now through Jesus have victory over death is not to say we have the power and the privilege to avoid or deny death. The crucified and risen Jesus doesn't lead us around death, doesn't lead us away from death. Instead, he invites us to follow him so he can lead us straight through death. One of the greatest mysteries of the gospel, scandalous in its own right, is that in order for us to participate in Jesus' victory over death, in order for us to enjoy freedom from the tyranny of death, we too have to embrace death with Jesus, just as he embraced death with and for us. This is at the heart of the meaning of baptism, isn't it? We die with Christ before we actually die so that we can live with Christ before we actually need to be physically raised from the dead. This is the way it works. We participate in his life and his death and his resurrection so that at baptism, we actually learn the shape of the Christ life, what some call the Pascal mystery, what we're calling this week cruciformity. The shape of the Christ life, there is life, there is death, there is resurrection. We live, we die, we live again. And yes, I know that's a line from Mad Max Fury Road, but I'm assuming some of you haven't seen it yet, and I'm going to reappropriate it in a different context. There is life, there is death, there is resurrection. We live, we die, we live again. That's the shape of the Christ life. And when we learn that at baptism, it gives us the power and the courage to embrace the many deaths we will encounter, physical, spiritual, and metaphorical throughout the rest of our lives, to embrace it with courageous faith. Robert Farrar Capone wrote that it's obvious that death is the engine of the old creation. We know that. He said, but the, the mystery of the gospel is that death is also the mystery or the engine of the new creation. Because before there can be new life, new creation, new birth, there has to be a death. And the gospel teaches us that every death entrusted to God has the potential for new life within it. In the movie, The Revenant, it's a bear of a movie, not for everyone, Leonardo DiCaprio's character gives us this line. He says, I ain't afraid to die anymore. I've done it already. I ain't afraid to die anymore because I've done it already. Doesn't that line belong in the mouth of everyone who's been baptized? I ain't afraid to die anymore. I've done it already, says the Christian who's threatened with execution by a terrorist if they don't renounce their faith. 
I ain't afraid to die anymore. I done it already, says the Christian sitting in a doctor's office receiving a white knuckle diagnosis. I, I, I ain't afraid to die anymore. I done it already, says the Christian sitting in a meeting, sizing up the competition, trying to figure out how to get an advantage without losing their soul in the process. I ain't afraid to die anymore. I done it already, says the Christian, embracing the death of an ideal life and mustering the courage to be honest about how much they're failing. Back in 2009, my family and I moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Austin, Texas to start a new church there. We were church planners. And I had a vision in my head of the ideal church, which is a fancy way of saying I wanted to start a church where I would be in charge. <laughs> so we would do things my way and I might end up making a name for myself. Old story, right? And 18 months after moving there, we pulled the plug on the project, and I got to add the title Failed Church Planter to my resume. And just like that, I was without a job, I was without direction, I without, was without a clue for what I was going to do with the rest of my life. It was the darkest time of my life spiritually, it was the hardest season of our marriage, I had never felt more hopeless and more helpless. And I know many of you have experienced things that are much, much worse. But I will tell you, for me, it devastated my life. I didn't know if I'd ever preach again. I didn't know if I would ever have the opportunity to work with another church again. I couldn't imagine that any church would want a failed church planner to be their preacher. And one of the things I learned from that experience is that many times Christians aren't very good at talking about failure, processing it, and responding to it. We're actually better at responding to moral failure with a message of forgiveness. We know how to do that. We're not sure how to process and respond to professional or creative or leadership failure. We're not sure how that kind of failure fits into our theology because we have this assumption that if you fail, it's because God wasn't part of it. And if God is really with you in your new endeavor when you start a company or you launch a church or you begin a new relationship, if God is really with you, of course it will be successful because God will bless your plans and you will be a success. But, but if you fail, then obviously God wasn't a part of that endeavor. And I find it ironic that we have such a poor theology of failure when failure is a part of our story from the very start. For three days, Jesus was a failure. Everybody, everybody, friend and enemy alike, thought he was a failure another pretender, just a failed Messiah. There's no way he was the anointed one. Obviously, God wasn't with him. He wasn't doing the will of God. There is no way if God had been with him, he would have suffered, he would have died, he would have been sealed in a tomb behind a stone. He was a failure. And when everyone thought Jesus was a failure... His father was the only one who knew the truth. That in what appeared to be his greatest moment of failure, his death on a cross, his humiliating death on a cross, what looked like failure was actually his greatest victory. If the gospel teaches us anything, it teaches us that failure is not a sign of God's absence. It's the beginning of a great story about God's faithfulness. It's not a sign of God's absence. It's the beginning of a story of God's faithfulness. And I wonder this morning if there's anybody here who's failing. Yeah. 
you, you know the dream of living an ideal life, having an ideal marriage, working with an ideal church, you know that dream is dead, but you can't bring yourself to admit it. The harder you work, the more you try, things at home, things at work, things at church, they're getting worse, not better. And you're doing everything you can to manage the appearance of your failure. You're doing everything you can to pretend it's okay, to make it look like you know what you're doing and you're holding it all together, but inside you know the truth. You can't talk to anyone about your failure because you've worked so hard to make it look like you're not one. But inside you know the truth. You are dying in every physical, spiritual, and metaphorical way possible. Instead of pretending, instead of pretending it's okay, instead of pretending you've got it all together, instead of pretending you know what you're doing, Instead of pretending you're not failing, you're not dying, you're not subject to death and decay, what if we let the story of Jesus and the shape of the Christ life show us what to do with our brokenness, our weakness, our failure? Show us what to do with the many deaths we experience over the course of a lifetime. Can we? Will we? Let us. Let us take them all and let's place them in a tomb and seal it with a stone and entrust our death to God. Never forgetting that in his battle against the forces of evil and against death and all his friends, our Father in heaven is undefeated.